Aaron, yes. All right, I gotta get my, my whole body ready to go. All right, people are coming on into the webinar. We're gonna also start streaming this live on Facebook. Give us a second to set up. Maybe while I do that, Jasmine, you can say hello to the 3540 bunch of attendees who are already here and introduce yourself, your bit quick figure of background and what you're now doing at the council. Sure. Hi, everyone. I am Jasmine Hoffman, the head of experience at the New Jersey Tech Council. Here at the council, I'm in charge of all things that we do facing the entire state and tech community, business community, government associations, basically anyone that wants to do anything here probably is coming from something that I've thought up or the team has decided we want to do. That includes events, membership benefits, mentorship opportunities, talent opportunities, all those things like that. So if after this webinar, anyone wants to reach out to me, my email is jasmine at njtc.org. If you have ideas or want to see how you can further be involved, please let me know. Uh, I come from a background of trade shows and tech events. I produced the, used to produce the Tech Day series of events in New York, LA, and London, and I was responsible for launching the events in uh, London and expanding them in New York and LA. I uh, also have a bit of a background in concert production, nonprofit work and things like that. So very excited to be here. We are thrilled to have you. Thank you very much for putting this together. This happens to be our best uh, registered webinar yet. We had over 100 registrations. We've got 78 so far dialed in. You can drop off whenever you'd like as we get into our conversation with Michael Chad Hefner. I'm psyched to have you, Michael. Thanks for joining us. Michael comes from GK Training. And what does GK Training primarily focus on? We primarily focus on communication. So we teach four basic things, speaking, writing, selling, and leading, those four things, all under the umbrella of communication. And that's with Fortune 100 companies, that's with individuals, it's with everyone from presidential candidates to high school students. Awesome. So. By the way, for those of you especially um, listening in, my name is Aaron Price. I'm the CEO of the New Jersey Tech Council. If you're, this is your first experience with us, welcome. If you're a, a, a repeat joiner, we're thrilled to have you back. But we're going to be doing quite a bit more of these sorts of experiences over the next weeks and months. So today we wanted to focus on effective communication, especially given some of the, the health conditions in the world. We're moving to a lot more remote work. Our office is now fully remote uh, starting yesterday. My wife started earlier this week. I think Google's going to the middle of April. Most um, most corporations seem to be going to optional, if not mandatory, remote work. So how does that change uh, the, the a person's ability or need to be um, an effective communicator with these sorts of tools? Yeah, well, the, the short answer is it changes it a lot. And it's happening fast. I teach at Columbia, and I got an email Monday morning saying, classes are canceled today and tomorrow. And on Wednesday, everyone's going to be teaching remotely. So the, the th interesting thing here about what's happening is so often companies will say, okay, we're going to do more of a remote workforce or we're going to telecommute one day a week. That's not the case right now. It is like entire organizations, academic institutions, Fortune 50 companies, global companies that tomorrow everything is going to be remote. It's happening very fast. So how does it change it? Well, it changes it fundamentally. I mean, on the most, most basic level, there's a giant barrier between you and whoever you're talking to that there didn't used to be. And even though right now I can see you nodding, I can hear you pretty well, there still absolutely is a barrier. So it changes, it changes the criteria of what good communication is or is not. So let's start with the basics, right? What's the right setup? For instance, you're standing, I'm sitting, you know, right. let's start with the physicality of how to prepare for a meeting. Yeah, now not everyone has to use a standing desk station or has a standing desk station. The idea here is just that because our bodies are designed to be mobile, we're designed to move around and people have really caught onto this in the workplace. Meaning everyone knows you should stand up and walk around every 60 minutes, you shouldn't sit all day, stuff like that. When you're at home, it can be very tempting to all of a sudden fall into a whole bunch of bad habits and just slump in your chair all day long. In a way, being remote has liberated us, though, a little bit that you can actually be much more mobile than you might typically be. That's not just important, though, for your good health, like metabolism and getting your steps in and how your brain is functioning. All those things are really important. But on the most basic level, you communicate better when you are using all of yourself. And by all of yourself, I actually just mean standing up as tall as you actually are. Your diaphragm has more space to move down 
Your lungs, therefore, can actually fill with enough air to support your voice. So speaking is actually a tremendously physical activity. And the more that you can set up your physical space for success, the better. Yeah. So uh, I do notice we have our first question, and I'll, and I'll remind all of you, feel free to, uh, there's a raise your hand function, which we're trying to pay attention to. It's a little uh, challenging to listen and pay attention to the chat, but we'll do our best. You can also jump into this chat if you have questions. But Michael Weiss asked, should meetings be shorter? Should they be more focused? How do you deal with chit chat and cross talking? We had a board meeting the other night. We used Zoom. We had 40 people. There were some of these types of challenges. How are these best managed? Yeah, well, there's a few thoughts here. One, yes, make them shorter. In fact, I've been coaching people to try to end their meetings, schedule the meetings to end at five or even 10 minutes before the hour. Now, we all have at least five minutes of fluff in every meeting. Honestly, like, let's be truthful. Most meetings, the first five minutes is fluff anyway. People join late, they dial in, they say, oh, I'm sorry, my last call went long. <laughs> You easily have five minutes of fluff in almost every meeting. Now, ending early is essential because the idea now is that you don't want every single meeting to slowly throughout the day, momentum style, roll into the next one and make everything later and later. And by the end of the day, you're not preparing for meetings and you feel like you're in the weeds the entire time. So those five minutes before meetings really need to be sacred. So yes, end earlier and tell people you're ending earlier and don't make that a bad thing. Make it a positive thing. Say, I'm putting five more minutes back into your day. You're welcome. So that would be one thing. Do you want to keep going or you look like you want to jump in? No, well, I was going to say in this case, we're scheduled to go for 30 minutes. I want to warn people we might go longer, but normally, yes, I appreciate that we're going to give you five minutes of your life back. Yeah, but this is different, isn't it? This is actually an educational forum. You've already set the parameters for people. You've been clear about that. You said, we're gonna go past. You can ask questions as we go. It's a pretty free form conversation. And if we go along, okay. People are voluntarily joining it. That's very different than you and me and three other coworkers are having a meeting about a project that has to launch in three weeks. That's a very different thing. Yeah. How important is it to set a schedule and how does setting a schedule differ in a virtual meeting versus an in-person meeting? Yeah. Well, a couple thoughts here. One is it just because you send an agenda around, as we know we're all supposed to do, send around the agenda, don't assume that anyone read it. We all know that. They probably didn't read it. There's a very good chance that they didn't read it. So it is important to restate the agenda at the beginning of the meeting. Now, everybody knows that. We all know that. And it's a little bit like the whole political uh, talking point of tell them what you're going to tell them, then tell them, and then tell them what you told them. But that structure does actually hold pretty well for a meeting. It does not need to be five minutes going through the agenda. You don't have to read the entire agenda statement you sent around, but it is useful to say, we're gonna talk about three things, implementation, execution, how we roll this out, and I wanna stop at 20 after the hour to make sure we have five full minutes for questions. Let's get started. It can be that easy, but what you're doing is you're giving your audience a roadmap and a sense of trust, and you're establishing that you are a trustworthy narrator, so they feel like they're in good hands. What about, you know, we talked about some of these elements before about, you know, right now, culturally, obviously, you know, I'm hoping we look back at this in many weeks and months and say, oh yeah, remember coronavirus. Yeah. Right now, do you think it's appropriate for people to start off a meeting with a joke about what's going on? I mean, you know, how, how do you, how can people humanize uh, what can be a little bit more of a robotic experience because we're not in person? Yeah, it's a really good question. I, I happen to think, and my answer on this, by the way, might change even seven days from now. But if you're watching this webinar right today, I don't think today is the day for the joke. I don't. Because there's so much chaos and there's so much anxiety about what is actually happening, what is not. And if you think about all the different strata of anxiety, there's economic and business, which by the way is small potatoes. This is like life and death for some people, many people. It's a huge shock to the system. So there are much better ways to speak about the elephant in the room because this is the elephant in the room right now for sure but there's better ways than probably joking about it now that might be different in a week honestly but for right now i would probably not use humor as a primary way in i would use something else any tips on what to use well you know you can simply ask people how's it going and the key thing here is you should ask them how is it going today or how are you doing today because if you say how are you doing what people tend to do is instantly well i'll tell you what do you say you ready aaron aaron how you doing I'm good. I'm a little freaked out, but I'm good. How are you? Yeah, so now you were brave, brave enough to say I'm a little freaked out. A lot of people, it's a reflexive, oh, I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. And what that does is create this, this 
separation, this falsehood actually of how we're really feeling and what we say. So even by putting a simple word on there, how are you doing today? Just that little thing gives enough context that people feel a bit more bravery to say like, wow, kind of worried, but I'm surviving. And even that tiny adjustment can help build some rapport and some camaraderie at the beginning of the call. So we're all not just faking it the entire time and like, oh yes, I'm excellent, how are you? Yeah, that makes sense. What about some other, you know, in, in the meeting prep, what are other physical things people can do to make sure some people might be rolling out of bed right before their first meeting? How do they make sure that their body is physically ready and that they sound ready, their brain, their, their mind is ready to go? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So everyone relates to the idea of having a frog in their throat or like the first call of the day is not my best call. People will say that all the time. And it, it really is a cop out because your first call could be your best call of the day if you actually woke up and got warmed up and ready to go. Being remote means that nobody who is working as a professional, nobody has an excuse to not get physically and vocally warmed up in the morning before you speak. That can be five minutes long. It doesn't have to be a ton of time, but warming up physically and vocally, it's the same thing that news anchors, that religious professionals, that politicians, Actors, of course, singers, it's the same thing people do simply to prime their voice and their body to sound professional when they speak. This used to get sort of a, a you know, people were judgmental and little snarky about this. That's gone away a lot because people have seen the value of a physical approach to things. And they also recognize it in athletics or music or the arts, people warm up. The idea here is you have to use your voice and your body a little bit to prime the pump and get ready to go. You can do tongue twisters, and in fact, I can show you a link later on to our website that has free ones that's available to anybody. But you can also just Google tongue twisters or do ones that you know as a kid. Get some energy going with your body, do a bit of a sports workout, warm up, anything to get your torso, your mouth, your breath, and your brain awake and alive is essential. 8.55 yeah. to 9 a.m. every single day, everybody's got to do it. It'll make your life better too. You'll feel better throughout the day. You're welcome. Not the, not the worst byproduct. We've got a bunch of questions rolling in, and I would encourage uh, any of you to keep going. We're, we're watching them, and I'm going to weave them into the conversation. Uh, starting with, how do how do people minimize distractions? Right, I'm I'm home in an environment, and for those of you watching, this is my kid's playroom. It's a little suboptimal, and while we're here, you know, the lights I'm working with, one of them died, so that's why we got this crazy shadow here. Yeah. But there are also distractions outside this door. My kids are home. I've got a dog who was barking earlier. How do people manage these things? so that they can still work effectively. And especially environments, you know, in our environment, culturally, maybe that's okay for the, for the office, but in other places that are more formal, that might not be so great. How do people manage those things? Yeah, well, I'll give you two ideas here. One is a bit of tough love, and the other is total liberation and freedom. The tough love is this, stop multitasking. I know that you think like, oh no, I'm good enough. I can keep my text window open or this other window open. I can do both things at once. You can't. There's a lot of research about how our brains have actually become worse at attending to things because we're used to all the time getting, getting that, notifi that notification. I'm trying to demonstrate it now, of course, but getting these notifications all the time that grab our attention. And it prevents our brains from actually attending to big picture important things and instead makes every single thing urgent, even if they're not important. So stop multitasking. When you're gonna go on video, close every window you don't need and make the video the full screen on your desktop so you're not tempted to actually look at all the things that are open on your desktop. Take your mouse, if you have a mouse, move it to the other side of your desk so that you're not having your dominant hand right there ready to click. If that doesn't work for you, hide the mouse and make a point of having to go get the mouse if you need it for the call. Find ways to stop multitasking, it's absolutely essential. And the other thing is that if you're multitasking, guess who else is? Everybody else on the call. So the call is not doing a darn thing. It's just actually a huge waste of time. And over time, it drags down people's morale. So that's the tough love. Stop multitasking. Turn off all your notifications. How good are you in live meetings at doing all those things? Are you someone who shows up, phones away, laptops gone, you're, you're totally present? Yeah, well, I have an easier job. I mean, ultimately, clients are asking me to come help them with how they communicate. I could not be doing that while I'm doing this the whole time. They wouldn't hire me. So yeah. it's for me. I put the phone away, I put the, the laptop away. I do work with lots of lawyers. It's 
frightening actually how much they're expected to be responsive with direct messages. They bill in six minute increments of time. That's not a lot of time, trust me. Yeah. So they're pretty wedded to their devices. If that's you, then the best thing to do is just set clearer parameters. If you really can only attend to something for 10 minutes, fine, but then give it undivided attention for 10 minutes. Even put an alarm on your phone, and then go to email or whatever it is for two minutes, but then put your attention back where, where it should be. Let's assume not everyone will be as disciplined in that regard, right? You, you helped Andrew Yang prep for his debates. And I'm sure part of that, that uh, preparation was around how you make sure, as you mentioned, right? Making the point over and over again. How can people knowing that others might be distracted effectively communicate their own needs and, and points in a, in, a, in a conversation, in a meeting, knowing that uh, there's potentially, I was a phone sitting next to me, I'm trying to manage this chat, there's a lot of stuff popping up. How do people communicate effectively in an environment where they're likely to be uh, talking to someone who's distracted? Yeah, well, I will just say first, the presidential campaigns and remote meetings are quite different, and I'll tell you why. First of all, my job was very easy with the Yang campaign because Andrew Yang, unlike I'm guessing many different politicians, he comes up with his best stuff. So his entire team is just helping him say the best ideas that he has because he has some pretty incredible ideas. What's different though too about a presidential election is that in a way it's closer to commercials where you just try to get these messages out there. You really have to be not necessarily repetitive, but you certainly have to be consistent with what you're saying. That's a little bit different than a remote meeting. In a remote meeting, in fact, you're hoping that you only have to say the same thing one or two times, because if you have to say it three or four or five times, it means no one's really listening. Yeah. So yeah. the point with all of this would be that those meetings, trying to get the attention of folks who are distracted, it partly depends on status, quite frankly. You can't call your boss out and say like, hey, get off your phone. If you are leading the meeting, though, you can in a fun way, in a lighthearted way, point out that we're gonna have a, a distraction-free zone for the next 10 minutes, and then I'll pause for 60 full seconds, I promise you, and you can check your devices. And then at minute 11, we're back. So you could do those sorts of things. You can also model being a good technology citizen yourself. Put your phone away. Talk at people's eyeballs, even if their eyes are down the entire time. Just still keep boring your eyes into the middle of their eyelids, even though you don't have their eyelids, because eventually what's gonna happen is they will finally look up and then when they do, they're gonna go, oh wow, someone's been looking at me this whole time. So you can try to model this even though other people might not. You know, with that in mind, it, this has been a little challenging because we got you know, a lot to, to control here doing this live, but I, I, you know, for those who are doing this, I shrunk the Zoom meeting. I put Michael's head as close to my webcam as possible so that when I'm looking at him and I'm, it looks like, it, hopefully it's working, I'm yep. looking at the camera because naturally Zoom has you sort of bot like you know, where I'm looking now, sort of bottom left versus where I have you now, which is more towards the webcam, which I think those subtle things can actually make a big difference. Huge difference. I'm glad you said that. I wanted to go there anyway. Move the windows of whatever software you're using, if it's Skype, if it's Zoom, whatever it might be, Google Hangouts. And just as you said, put the windows as close to the top of your camera lens as you possibly can. So that as you're looking at people speaking, your eyes aren't going all the way down here, but they're just making a subtle adjustment to here. Let's say you also have to reference a doc. So let's say you're walking through a you know, 25 point issue list of some kind. You can put the doc as high as possible as well. So that counts. And the, the other thing I'll add about that, Aaron, too, is that let's say you can't do that. Your audience gets nervous when you look off screen because they don't know what's over there. So they either feel like there's something that's more interesting than them or you're doing something more fun than they are and they're jealous. So you can actually help yourself by literally translating for people what you're doing. So you can even say like, I'm gonna grab a, grab a notepad or I just wanna jot that down for a second. So you actually tell people, not the whole time, you don't have to give it a, you're not like a, a sports anchor or something giving like a play by play, but at a couple key moments, you tell them what you're doing so they have that comfort. And if you do it a couple times, they develop greater trust that they can trust you. And then when you are doing things that take your eyes away from that camera, they have greater trust that you're still present in the conversation. Yeah, totally. That's a great point. Someone asked a more practical question that I just lost in the stream, but it was basically in a normal meeting, you have the ability to do uh, quite a bit of whiteboarding. Any suggestions of tools of how people can do that remotely? And I can share, and I'll do this while you answer that question, 
in Zoom at least, there's a share screen option. I can choose a whiteboard. And now Michael and I can both see the whiteboard. Hello, I can draw on this with a pen if I wanted to. So there's, uh, the pen didn't work, there we go. Um, the, this, this was not a good thing to test live, but you can do quite a bit here um, to, to share remote work. Any, any other thoughts there, Michael, about ways people can collaborate? Yeah, I do. I'm gonna do something really unconventional right now, which is I'm going to put a cliffhanger into this. And that is that I don't have any specific software recommendations right off the bat, but I do happen to know someone who is working on some pretty incredible software and they're within weeks coming out because they've been through several betas now. They're very far along with really pretty revolutionary software that allows those exact kind of things. Greater integration between different folks who are part of the audience, better ways to pass some time if you're not included in the conversation, better ways to store things, in a bit of a parking lot to come back to, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So if when it launches you're interested, I'm more than happy to share the information about that. But beyond that, I, I don't, I, I'm agnostic about the tools that are currently out there. I'll say it that way. Yeah, that makes sense. So we had another question, which is, um, this person said their struggle is that most of their distractions come from 20 different Slack conversations that uh, she's, in, I think it's a she is involved in. And that the whole team is work from home as a manager. I have to stay involved so people aren't blocked, but it makes it so it's, I can't fully concentrate on my own tasks. And I mean, this is a very real struggle. I think most people have with digital communication. How do people stay focused with all these notifications coming? Yeah, so what I would encourage people to do is try to build some principles that they live by and that they can then apply it to a bunch of different situations. Because if you have a whole set of rules for Slack and then a whole set of rules for Zoom and a whole bunch of rules for when you're doing doc sharing and a whole bunch of rules for if you have some collaborative software, it can get really confusing. So one simple rule would be transparency. And what I mean by that is you actually say the activity of what you're doing, you call out what you're seeing but in a very positive way. So you could even say like, I know many of us are on the same Slack channel. I'm gonna ask that we don't DM for the next 10 minutes because I want everyone's attention on such and such. After that 10 minute period, if you have follow-up things you think are important to send offshoots about or even create new groups, go for it. But the next 10 minutes, let's do blank. So yeah. that, calling it out, you're naming it. And in a way, empathize with everyone else. They're in the same position. They're like, oh my God, my Slack channel's blowing up. Okay, what else is happening? Uh, and by naming that, you actually give some people some relief. Yeah. Tactically, you could also create smaller groups in Slack and only invite certain people to certain conversations, but that's just a much more tactical decision. Yeah, that makes sense. What, so Deanna asked, but what about managing up? No one wants to be considered to be slacking while working from home. How do you make sure that you are as visible as possible without adding fluff and noise? And she's saying, as you know, for example, copying everyone on an email. Is there a secret to the to the balance so that people realize you're working when they can't physically see you? Yeah, you know what I would say is for right now, like hold that thought for a month. I don't think anybody, I don't think their primary concern right now is everybody's slacking off from home. I think everyone is just in crisis management mode right now. And I think email overload is more real right now than it will be even in a month or six weeks. So I think right now I would tilt on the balance of people know that you're working from home. They know you're doing your best. I think adding more communication to the screen just to show that you're present is probably not necessary right now. It may be in three months. You may have to find better ways to demonstrate what you're doing. I would not worry about it right now. How often do you think, like we've been discussing, at what cadence should the entire team check in? with one another to, to be in touch. How often do you think it is that it's important for people to, to be checking in? Yeah, you know, I, I, I don't mean to dodge that question, but I think it just so much depends on the project, the team, what you're working on. I think it really depends. Could be yeah, that's hourly, could be daily, could be weekly. I'll yeah. put the back to you. I mean, you're, you're running an organization, you have multiple teams, what would you say? We're, we're starting with twice a day to see how that goes. Um, we've got a lot of open projects, so there's a lot of touch points. I also think it's going to be good for camaraderie in the organization just to get people in front of others. I mean, I'm thinking about the same thing with my kids. Like, how do we get them, you know, social with their friends multiple times a day and, you know, so that they don't start to lose their minds but we're locked inside for the next yeah. two weeks or so or whatever, you know, their school is, what happens to have spring break for the next two weeks, but it was canceled today. Um, I think the social human behavior is going to change a lot over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I, I agree. That in, so, and, and I, I will say that with that in mind, you know, when we have a physical meeting, it's very easy to read the room, 
to get a sense this person's kind of itching to ask a question. That's a lot harder to do in a remote situation. And so one thing that I did the other day that I found was effective, I'm curious what you, what you would suggest, was that I told people normally it would be rude to interrupt. In this scenario, please do interrupt because it's a lot harder socially to read the room to understand who might be, you know, who might want to have a question. And in fact, we want to encourage that kind of thing as opposed to frown on it. That worked reasonably well. And we had people on the phone who couldn't see and, and they did interrupt and it was a great way to keep the dialogue going. I wonder if you have any other tips like that to that, that you know, how things change when we're more, when we're communicating digitally. Yeah, well, actually what I will do is compliment you for that thing. And I, I will compliment you not even for the strategy, but for the principle. So in other words, you set very clear terms and expectations for how this call is going to work. You can imagine another group in which in person, they all talk over each other all the time and it works great. It's like a kinetic, vibrant, creative space. You take that, that whole energy remote and it's a disaster. No one can hear anything that anyone's saying. So that place, they might do the opposite. They might say, hey, listen, because we're such a great creative team and everyone just chimes in, it's gonna be hard to do that on the phone. So what I'm gonna ask is that give a one second pause between when someone's finished before you begin speaking just for this phone call today. And we're gonna test it and see how that works. So it's not that you have to go one or the other, always interrupt or don't, but what you did is you set forth a principle and that's the exact kind of transparency and, and clear parameters that I'm talking about, setting up meetings so that you have the best chance to be successful. Yeah, do you think people should encourage others to use video? You know, some people, I'm very comfortable on video. I know you're very comfortable on video. Some people really are not so into it. Do you think that people, you know, companies should encourage their employees if, you know, to be on video versus be on the phone? Yeah, you know, I used to have a different answer on this. I used to say the most important thing is whatever people are most comfortable with and whatever will bring out their best ideas. So if they really hate video, turn off the camera, and just share your best ideas. I give a different answer now. I think that for the time being, if you're talking about an entire global organization going remote overnight, you need to give yourself as good a chance as possible to succeed. And that probably means the more input, the better meaning you probably have a better shot to understand each other by seeing each other. You can have a clear sense of who's present, who's uh, at their best that day, who's not, how to support those people, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, for right now, if I were leading a larger organization, I lead a small organization, not a large one, but I would be pushing my people towards camera. Yeah, that makes sense. What, what are a few things that, what are, what are three best practices, but I, I'd rather you start even with, what are three things people commonly do wrong? What are easy fixes? Yeah. Well, the first one I already touched on, I'm going to hit it again, though, which is that they totally underestimate how important their vocal presence is. Remote. If you're on a phone call, all you have is the sound of your voice. That's it. And vocal variety. There will not be a test on those people, but vocal variety is made up of five P's. They are pace, pitch, pause, power, and placement. And those are the factors that made your voice have rise and fall. A monotone voice on a phone or a video conference is absolutely deadly. In person, you might be able to forgive the person because you have their eye contact. On the phone, it's deadly. I mean, you can already hear people dropping off the webinar right now from that 10 second bit of speaking I just did. So anything you can do to physically and vocally get yourself engaged in the phone call or the audio or video call, you have to do. Warming up is a big part of that. I encourage people, if it's a phone call, get your hands-free device, move around the room, get your body and your voice as active as you possibly can. So that would be one yeah. thing. Second is I see people mess themselves up with transparency all the time. They don't embrace it and they try to hide whatever is going wrong. So if they have a bad connection, they just kind of tolerate it for way too long. And then eventually they say, I'm gonna dial back in or I'm gonna do something. Or if they've forgotten the document, they don't take the time to do it. Whereas in person, they'd say, oh my God, I forgot this thing on my desk, let me grab it. They somehow feel more pressurized on the phone or on the video that I have to be flawless and they don't, they can just name that. That even goes, by the way, for you asked earlier about actual real life disruptions or interruptions in the space. People are gonna be a bit more forgiving right now and a bit more empathetic because of what's going on. So if you've done all the things you can do, but then some interruption happens you can't control, like the kids do come barging in or the dog is barking, you can feel free to name that. My daughter's school got closed today. I'm working from home, they're here too. Honey, I'll be done in five minutes, okay? Say hi to everyone, honey. Hi everyone. Okay, bye. 
that sort of thing, you can actually be much more transparent with that right now than you could sometimes. And it will actually help build morale and camaraderie and, and a feeling of community. So those are two. You want a third one or you want to jump in? If, if you've got a quick third one, let's, let's hear it. Okay, These are good, so let's keep it coming. All right, the quick third one is this, is be mindful of how you ask questions. Don't ask random rhetorical questions that you don't really want an answer to, or worse, don't ask yes or no questions that somewhere you know people are not gonna even respond to, but you just do it anyway. So the biggest culprit, of course, is like, are there any questions? No one says anything, and you just keep on going. So instead, make your questions more specific, and if you want responses, even make them assumptive, meaning that you're assuming there are responses. An example like that would be, Aaron, what questions do you have about how we're gonna roll this out between now and May? You're gonna probably have some kind of question. And if you don't, you're gonna give me more than just like nothing. You'll probably give me some kind of response and or bring up what you actually do have a question about if it's not about that subject. So those are a few. Yeah, yeah th that's great. What do you think that the upside, or do you see an upside? Right now it's a particularly, I think it's a particularly tense time today yeah. specifically. Each day feels like it gets a, a, a degree uh, hotter. Um, what do you, th and I think one of the reasons that we want to do this is this gives people some control of something in their lives that otherwise we have, a, you know, there's some lack of control happening right now. But this yeah. is some area where I think we can have some, some control and focus. But what do you think might be the upside of this over time? Might this, you know, does this accelerate the future of work? What are the, what are the benefits of that? And where can people find a silver lining in, in you know, what we're all feeling right now? Yeah, well, you know, there's two. There's two I can look for. I mean, I would really echo what you just said. I'm not a rocket scientist. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a healthcare worker. I'm trying to do what I can to give some helpful tools to people out there. And if it helps make their life a bit better today, good. And I think we're all trying to do that, do what we can in a challenging, intense situation. So in terms of upside, there is the chance that people become even healthier physically because of this. There's a chance. It might go the other way. I don't know. But there's a chance simply because people can actually be much more mobile throughout the day than they might at work. There's a chance. And that would be a big thing in our society. If you think about what uh, chronic obesity, what health challenges are, simply because we have such a sedentary life as people in our work society, that is one small potential benefit here. The other is that we might build a new appreciation of when remote is good and when it just isn't very effective. So we've seen this movement where everyone wanted to work from home, everything is remote, and then people slowly began to trickle. No, I actually like being around people during the day. People, even if you look at shared workspaces, people want to gather. And this crucible might bring much more attention to when remote is really effective and when it's not. And then hopefully, if we have a you know, a, a period of relaxation or recovery or however you would frame it after this, that we're able to choose our spots better for when we should embrace remote and when we should really make the effort to make sure we can gather in person. It'd be nice if there was some like giant tech festival where we could all meet and celebrate, you know, the last few months of it having been a little bit tense. Yeah, to think about that. I can't, nothing comes <laughs> to mind at all. Oh, wait, wait, maybe you might know one. I, I might know one of those. Yeah, you want to put a plug in for that particular thing, Eric? <laughs> I'm sure all of these people will hear me we invite them frequently to the Propellify Innovation Festival, which is happening on September 24th. Um, someone asked a practical question. We'll wrap up in, in, in five minutes or less for those of you curious about how much longer we'll go. But someone said, you know, I did mention uh, one of my, the lights died in this room, but I still was struggling with the lighting. I've got this giant shadow behind me here. Your lighting's more crisp, and I'm wondering, just from a practical perspective, my setup is I have my laptop elevated on one of those stands. I had two lights, I'm using my laptop mic. So what do you think best practices are for the technology, the, the, the hardware setup, and, and the lighting setup? You, you know, clearly right now you're, you're beating me there. Yeah, well, a couple thoughts on this. One, you can go far with production values. So I'm doing a few things correct. One, I have natural light that's coming in this way at me. Natural light is the best. Yellow, like incandescent light, that's the second best. Third best is any kind of LED, and it's better for energy savings, so I'm not putting it down, but I'm saying for how you look on camera. So if you can possibly find natural light that's coming at you from the front, it's better. 
Backlit is not so good. Think about when you're trying to you take a picture of a friend with their phone, the sunsets in the back, they're lit from behind and you can't see them at all because of that backlight. So that's not quite as good. But there's some things that I'm not doing as well. So just a totally plain white background can also get a little bit dry. If you have some subtlety back there to give some visual things to look at, that might be nice. Bookshelf, things like that. Color patterns, you wanna go with solid color patterns. But now here's a caveat. I'm throwing those at you pretty quickly and I'll tell you why. It doesn't matter that much. It does, it helps people, but the people who are on video with you, they're not as hung up on that as you are most likely. You might be like, gosh, I hate how I look in this light. I hate how I look, I hate how I look. I hate this sweater. Ah, oh, that's a terrible angle. They're not thinking about that because you know what they're thinking about? Oh, I hate my light, I hate my sweater, I hate this angle. They're thinking about themselves. So the most- I'm looking, I'm going, you look fantastic. <laughs> The most important thing actually is that you're focusing on trying to get your communication through to them. They're not gonna be as hung up on those things as you are. So yeah. use some best practices, do your best, but don't get hung up on it. Natural light from the front, be mindful of your angle, look at the camera, try to have a not too distracting background, solid colors and you're good to go. I would say I think the most important thing, I wonder if you agree with this, is the angle of the camera. There's a lot of people who put a laptop on their lap or on the desk, and then you got the up the nose under chin shot, which doesn't look good for anybody. You're absolutely right about that. And the other thing that happens is that, you know, the most frequent question I ever get when teaching public speaking anywhere in the whole world, anyone who takes a public speaking program with my firm, someone in the audience will ask, what should I do with my hands? And I always say it is not as big of a deal as you're making it. We get way too much thought suppression about don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. All these don'ts with our hands so we become paralyzed with what we should actually do. And even worse, all we're thinking about is ourselves and our dumb gestures. That's one big way to introduce this idea though, which is the following. If you have your laptop at an angle right below you and you're talking with your hands a lot, the problem is, is that your hands are closer to the wide angle lens of your camera than your face is. So like a claymation character or a superhero character with giant hands, then your gestures actually do have a chance to become problematic. So I think you're right about the angle. Strive for eye level, strive for far enough away so you can actually look like you are in real life as opposed to this weird, close, far distance proximity. That's a good point. So elevated and ideally in front of or next to a window. Yeah. Especially for those who aren't as hardcore as me and buying lights. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Well, we do this a lot. Yeah. Um, so in closing, yes. I'll put you on the spot here. What's what, what what's one thing I did I could have done better? I mean, this this was a live virtual meeting. What's something I could have done better? What's something that I did well? Hmm. I think now, in fairness to your audience, I know you pretty well at this point, Aaron, as a communicator, so I'll throw out a couple of thoughts, but I do think you do a very good job of moderating a conversation, letting the person add some real value, but not letting them go on forever and ever and ever. And you're pretty good at inserting yourself, moving the conversation along and having it be a nice back and forth, but not rapid fire, like some sort of uh, attacking cable news show where no one can actually finish a point. I think you do a really good job of that overall. Appreciate that. And that's all the time we have. Oh, good. You're done. You're done. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I want to hear the bad thing or the, the area for improvement, but I appreciate that. Well, probably if we stick with the stuff we talked about in this actual session, you probably could have done a little bit better job at framing at the beginning what we're going to do in the next 30 minutes, when we're likely going to end. And if you have any questions about this specific thing, I'd love to get them now or whatever it might be, meaning give your audience more guidance about what the next 30 minutes looks like. Yeah, totally fair. It, and I meant to do that. And under the stress of going live, I forgot to do that. But totally fair point. And, and uh, we'll do that next time. So for people who want to stay in touch, um, there are two resources that I would recommend. One is uh, the resources section on Michael's website, gktraining.com, which if I get really fancy, I might even be able to share while we're live, I'm stalling. I can't do it. Sorry. But gktraining.com, right? And slash resources. 
And also, here's the area that we really need to, to help Michael out. Uh, because of the work that he does, a lot of it is behind the scenes. So he does not have a huge forward-facing presence, and I'd like to help him change that. So I want all of you listening, if you're going to do one thing, he provided a lot of value here. If you're going to do one thing to repay the favor is follow him on Twitter. His handle is, I lost, oh, here it is, M.C. Hepner, which is H-O-E-P-P-N-E-R, M.C. Hepner. I'll, we'll, we'll tweet it out. If you follow any of the stuff we do, we'll be very easy to follow him. But let's try to like double his social media following in the next 24 hours. That would be awesome. Um, we really appreciate you spending time with us today. Uh, I, I think it was a lot of valuable information. We might, we might bring you back on as things unfold to see how the market's changing and how communication is evolving in this uh, new normal. But uh, really appreciate you spending some time. And thanks, everybody, for watching. That concludes today's webinar. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Thanks, everyone.